Hello there again, friends and neighbors. Thanks so much for coming again to my channel. This is me, Stella Hendricks, and today we are gonna be doing chapter nine of The Girl in the Centerfold by Surrey Marsh. As always, I will only be reading excerpts. I will not be reading the entire thing um, because I don't think you're allowed to do that. <laughs> and also it would take a really long time. Uh, so uh, I would really encourage you to buy your own copy of this and read it and form your own opinions. Of course, these are all just my opinions and I would love to get feedback from you too. So uh, jumping right into it, chapter nine. This chapter is called Biff. It is apparently a pseudonym that she has applied to a gentleman that she is talking about in this chapter. And it just cracks me up because my grandma had a dog named Biff. And every time I hear that name, I just think about that stupid dog and how my uncle used to tell me if I was naughty, then the dog was gonna bite me. I had an uncle who, he was, he was like a cousin, this uncle, uh, he was only a couple of years older than me, big Mormon families. And uh, he was kind of like one of us kids and he would harass us a little bit. He was like the oldest of the cousins. <laughs> anyway, total tangent, um, <clears throat> here we go. First thing I highlighted, I think it is, okay. I'm no great expert on birds and the bees. I didn't start this earlier, did I? No, I read that whole other chapter. Okay, all right, we'll just start here. I'm no great expert on birds and bees, but it has been a while since I didn't know that a man does things with hands besides snuff, snap his knuckles. I've never been afraid of a man. No man has ever gotten me to do anything against my will. But then there was Pompeo Posar, wasn't there? I've always wanted to do what I did, at least at the time. I was, no, that's not right, quite right either. What I mean is that I'm the one responsible, rightly or wrongly. No man can get a woman into bed unless she wants to, but then she can be made to want to, can't she? I said this was awfully difficult to write, not alone because of my own embarrassment and the predictable attitudes of at least some of the people reading this, but also because I don't understand myself or my actions. I think Mr. Hefner ought to hop onto his rotatable bed, take a couple of spins, and write another installment of the Playboy philosophy. Only this ought to be called the Playgirl's philosophy, in which he explains the whys, the hows, and the where's this all leading that a girl wants to know. Perhaps I can supply him some background material on the girl. <laughs> I moved in with Biff. When I was a little girl, you see, I had a dream, and his name was Biff. Biff, I don't know any Biff. I know you don't, but we're about to change that. Where'd you get my number? From a guy at the Playboy Club, Dick. Dick? Oh, the assistant room director. I've been trying to reach you for three weeks. I've called every evening. I've been away, Chicago, shooting a centerfold. You're a playmate. Hey, great man, you're on your way. Oh, I don't know about that. I heard you were interested in show business. No, I don't know. I thought about it, but look, I'm in show business. I'm a musician. I might be able to help you. Why don't you grab some of your photos, hop a cab, and come over to my place? I don't even know you. We'll get acquainted. You do have a nice voice. Come on, hop a cab. I'll pay the fare. Such generosity should not go unrewarded. Biff and I lived in the village. He was standing out front when the cab drew up. He shoved a bill at the driver and helped me out, or maybe it was the other way around. Biff looked like his voice. He was tall, deeply tanned, dark, wavy hair, and the most ruggedly handsome face I'd ever seen. He took me up to his apartment. It was on the seventh floor. He showed me around. His books, his records, playing some, and his photographs. He was a photographer as well as a music musician. He looked at my photographs. Hey, you're good. You got it, you know? I didn't know. How about some wine? I've got some great wine. I don't care much for wine. Oh, this is different. You'll love it. I loved it. We sat on the couch. How would you like me to read you some poetry? I'd love poetry. And so while I sipped red wine, he opened a book and began to read. But our love, it was stronger by far than the love of those who were older than we, of many far wiser than we, and neither the angels in heaven above nor the demons down under the sea can ever dissever my soul from the soul of the beautiful Annabel Lee. He read some more poems. As far as I was concerned, he could never stop. 
If I had known a moment could be this sweet, I would have dreamed better dreams. <laughs> when I awoke in the morning, he was gone. An early rehearsal or something, but he left me a note. No one, neither angels nor demons, can ever dissever my soul from your soul. See you tonight. He did. After a month, our living apart became rather foolish. I subleased my apartment and moved in with him. It had to be the happiest time of my life. Bliss, thy name was Biff. Poetry and wine at night, love notes in the morning. It was hard to imagine that everything and anything could ever dissever my soul from Biff's soul. <laughs> So if you're not familiar with that poem, that is actually a poem by Edgar Allan Poe. You'd think like, what, this, doesn't he like wrote like super scary stuff? And yes, he does. And that is, if you read the whole poem, it's scary and tragic because of course it is, it's Poe. But it's also beautifully written. I know it sounds like such a cliche to say that Poe is your favorite poet, but he honestly is. If you haven't ever read uh, The Bells, I think The Bells is probably my favorite a uh, poem written by him. Um, I think I'm supposed to talk about this. Oh yeah, oh yeah. So I am, yeah, very obsessed with Edgar Allan Poe. When I was a uh, kid, when I was uh, supposed to be in uh, middle school, my parents, uh, they pulled me out of public school and they put me into a private like Christian school. And after I was there for two months, a very short amount of time, the Christian school brought in an anti-Mormon like speaker and we all sat in like this assembly and had a sermon about how, not like specific, he talked about a couple other different people too, but also about how the Mormons are a cult. And I mean, they are, but at the time I was a Mormon and that seems like kind of a weird thing to be doing when one of your students who's paying you to go to your, and it wasn't just me, my cousin too. And my sister had gone there before. It was wild to me that they did that, but they did. And so uh, I got taken out of that school and I was supposed to be homeschooled, but my mom was really busy and I was just not a priority to them. And so I didn't go to school for two years. They just kind of forgot. They kept forgetting to sign me up for something. But fortunately, I had this wonderfully, highly intelligent, self-educated grandmother who uh, was an incredible, I mean, she could have been an English uh, literature expert. She knew everything. She'd read every book. She was like walking Cliff's notes. It was incredible. So once a week, I would get sent over to my grandmother's house and... Um, I memorized the Gettysburg Address, the letter to Mrs. Bixby, the entire poem of the Raven, uh, the Highwaymen. That poem is to this day one of my absolute favorites. Um, and I got a really good, a really thorough and very advanced uh, education in English, even though I was not being educated in anything else at the time. Uh, my English skills were second to none, and I think uh, sometimes they still remain that way. Ugh, certainly I'm not good at math. Ugh, it's a whole nother story. So, uh, oh yeah, so this is where I started to feel kind of conflicted about continuing to read this book because she talks in here about how she didn't want to do the centerfold, but she got talked into it by Pompeo Posar. And as she's talking about this book and how she wants to, she, she doesn't understand herself. And I think she kind of verbalizes that even in this book, that she doesn't understand why she's writing the book, but she feels compelled to do so. And I was kind of starting to feel like, girl, were you getting coerced into even writing this book? Like, did you want to do this even? Like, ah, oh. so I, I was having a hard time continuing because I didn't, I felt somehow like I was violating consent. I don't know. It was totally weird. But the more I thought about it, I kept reading and I thought, no, because it is telling her story and it is my opinion and take on the story. And I'm not reading the entire part of it. And there are parts that are very uh, sexually graphic and wonderful to read. She's a wonderful author. But those are the parts especially that I feel like maybe she f was coerced into putting in here for like making it more salacious or something. I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what her publishers were, publishers were up to. I don't know if it was all her. I, I honestly don't know. 
So I thought I'll just leave the stuff out that feels salacious to me and leave in the parts that stand out to me as really important to the storyline. So I think that's how I'm gonna deal with that moving on. The last thing is the Playboy and the Playgirl philosophy. I actually think that's a wonderful idea. Someone should write the Playgirl philosophy. I rather think that's what my whole uh, Stella Hendricks channel is up to in my Cracklin' Rosie project. I do Cracklin' Rosie and I do Starlets and Harlots. And they're my absolute fave. And yeah, I kind of feel like that's what I'm up to. I'm writing the Playgirl philosophy. <laughs> And oh yeah, I don't think Ol' Hef was uh, quite qualified to uh, write the Playgirl philosophy. Uh, I don't even think that Gloria Steinem could write it either. I think it would take someone like Bridget Marquardt or Jane Mansfield or me or someone who really wanted to be in that world and felt passionate about posing, about nudity, about uh, freedom of expression and all these things. Yeah, I think there's quite a couple of us who could write that. I think it would be good. So another very short episode. These chapters are so short. The The girl in the centerfold certainly doesn't take as long as my Playboy reviews, but that's okay. I think we're going to keep uh, just shooting through these as quick as fast as, quick as fast possible. <laughs> I can speak. When I get nervous, I stutter, and I also tangle my words into absolute knots. But uh, yeah, next time we'll dive into that. And I am also pretty soon gonna do an episode where I get a whole bunch of my Playboy uh, themed books and we're gonna put them all out. And I would really love if you guys will help me choose which book we're gonna read next for Stella's Book Club. It's gonna be great. So thank you so much for coming. Oh, do you like my Hooters shirt? This is another one of my Hooters shirts. <laughs> thank you so much for coming and I'll catch y'all on the flip side.